And so I decided that I wanted to make sure that I show up for you guys more, that I can hear your questions, hear what you guys are struggling with, hear what you want to know, and then bring on the right people to be able to help answer. And because I feel so damn selfish that I get to spend such amazing quality time with people like Terry, that I wanted to start opening up my studio here at Women of Impact so that you guys can come in and be not just like a fly on the wall anymore, but actually be involved in asking people the questions that you really want to know. So. Terry, welcome. Why, thank you. And I'm so happy to be here. And before we get started, Terry has a workbook out. We just did an hour and a half interview together about this, and it's freaking amazing. So, guys, you've got to go check this out. And we did a poll on YouTube to see what you guys actually wanted to, know, uh, to ask as the first question. Now, as we answer, make sure you put in the comments. We are watching. We've got a whole team back here, so excited, who are looking through your comments. And um, I can't see the comments, though. You guys have blocked it. Oh, no. So this is the first time, so I'm sure we're going to have a couple of tech errors. But um, I've got a TV off here so that I could actually see you guys. And see, Lou, if you can make sure, you guys, I can't see the comments. I want to see your comments. So guys, if you can fix this tech and while you do that, I'm going to answer uh, I'm going to read out the first the first question. So this was you guys um, we did a poll. We're going to be doing a lot of polls on the community, so go check out the community page often. But the first question or in fact the poll, the winning answer question Terry was how do I set boundaries with my family? Mm. Well, let's start with why it's hard. Mm. Right, because a lot of times we, times we could set boundaries, let's say, at work. But with family, when you think about boundaries, right, how we set them, and in relationships, it's like doing a dance, right? I do this, then you do that. I say this, then you say that. That's basically how boundaries work. When you think about your family system, they're the, they're the people you've been dancing with the very longest in your life. They're kind of like the original dance troupe, mm -hmm. if you will. So in our lives as we get healthier and grow and evolve we can meet new people we can establish boundary boundaries morally because they didn't know us when we were 10 when we were 5 when we were 15 a lot of times with family they really resist us changing they really want to be like you are like you were when you were 15 mm -hmm. and you're obviously hopefully not like you were when you were 15 so i think part of it is try, try to understand that the difficulty that you have is really normal and it's okay and there's nothing wrong with you and i say let's start slowly and gently with creating boundaries with family of origin in particular and so first you have to establish what boundaries are needed right because that's how i could really answer your question is what is it that you're struggling with does your mother expect you and your family to come home for christmas every year even though you really want to spend christmas at your own house Right? That would be a boundary conversation that you would have to have to disappoint your mother. How would you approach that? Right? I, you know, I lo love that you create Christmas for us every year, and I really want to have Christmas at my own house. I'm thinking that next year we're going to come the weekend before Christmas to celebrate with you guys, or like that. Right? We, we come up with alternatives, but I want you to understand that it's hard to do it with your family for a reason, and the more you do it, the easier it gets. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a version that may be a little harder than Christmas, okay. because it's like almost, it's comments, right? Where family may make comments where, let's say you're eating, and your family's like, oh, you're on that health kick, are you? And so there's all these like snide, passive aggressive comments that they're not actually saying, like you know, they're not actually making fun of you, but it starts to like really upset you. How would you address a comment like that? I think you can be honest and say, hey, Dad, I don't appreciate you commenting on what I'm eating. Right? Okay, and can now you? I'm going to play devil's advocate. Okay. Dad turns around and is like, oh, aren't we too sensitive? I also don't need your input on my sensitivity. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. I mean, I think you yeah. can say, I don't know, Dad, I don't think I'm being honest with you because I love you. Mm -hmm. Right? So I don't, I don't feel like I'm being sensitive. I feel like when you say I'm on a health kick, it makes me feel like you're making fun and you're judging, and I'm not judging what you're eating, so I'm just asking you to give me the same respect that I give to you. I don't want to fight about this, and I don't want to feel bad about it. I'm eating the best way that I know how to keep myself healthy, mm -hmm. so I just don't want it to be a topic of conversation. It makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, That's so strong. I love that. All right, guys, next question. This is from Michelle Strand. 
How can I set boundaries specifically with my mother-in-law or should my partner do that? That, Michelle, I feel you. That is such a good question. And I cannot tell you how many mother-in-law questions I get about boundaries, so many. I think there's two answers to this. One is that a lot of times, if you are having mother-in-law, daughter-in-law conflict, the origin of that conflict usually is some unresolved conflict between the mother and the son. So your insight, Michelle, is correct in that there is something between your partner and your partner's mother that needs to be handled. What happens often is that there becomes a triangle when people get married where from a traditional standpoint, a lot of times the husband will sort of put the relation, keeping the relationship going with their mother onto their wife or there's conflict where now the mother might feel threatened, that the, the wife now has more power than her. All of this is unhealthy stuff. And the rea let's first talk about the reality of what's appropriate. When you get married, that person becomes your first family. Hopefully your first priority, should be your top priority. Then you have children and they're your next priority. So when my kids got married, we were I was like, your wife, is now your first family. Me and dad and your brothers, we're now your family of origin. Like you gotta make decisions that are right for the family that you're building and what you're doing. Not everyone, listen, I've been a psychotherapist for 25 years, not everyone has that attitude. So I think you can talk to your partner, Michelle, about the difficulty you're having with the mother-in-law and the boundaries and definitely a portion of that he needs to be handling. He needs to be hitting that. And then if it's something personal between you and your mother-in-law, that is something that you can handle yourself. How do you do it is a question. You do it respectfully. You do it honestly. You can use language like, hey, I'd like to make a simple request. Let's just say that your mother-in-law is stopping over your house without calling. Hey, I'd like to make a simple request that you text to make sure it's a good time before you stop by because I'm working from home. A lot of times I'm on meetings and I don't want to miss you and I don't want to seem rude to you, right? We can always sort of frame it that we're thinking of them too, especially with your mother-in-law, right? Because there is a power differential where you want to be respectful, I imagine, of your mother-in-law. So that's a way I think that you can frame that. Mm. But do it yourself, don't do it through your partner. If it's direct, if what your mother-in-law is doing is directly impacting you. Let's say your partner works out of the house, but she's swinging by during the day mm -hmm. without calling. Then I do believe that is a between you and your mother-in-law conversation that you can do lovingly. If it's an overall problem where maybe the mother-in-law expects um, that you'll go on, you, you and your partner will go on the family vacation every single year for two weeks or something that you really don't want to do, but it's been like an established thing. That's something that I think has to be discussed mm -hmm with your, um, that your partner has to talk to the mother about that, because that sort of was originated before you got there. Mm -hmm. I love that difference. All right, so I'm just gonna take a quick look at the comments. Guys, let's read a couple of the comments out there. Um, what up, people? So, oh, they've got a lot of questions. All right, so the question is, how do I live with a narcissistic mother? Well. And sorry, this is from H. Bunny. Okay, H. Bunny. Well, first of all, I'm sorry to hear it because I know that that is painful. I think that you have to be really emotionally self-protective if you are living with a narcissist, whether it's a partner, whether it's a mother, whether it's a sibling, that you have to be aware that if you know anything about narcissism, you know that these are not emotionally trustworthy people. So don't tell your mother the thing you're really excited about because she's most likely going to either rain on your parade right in the moment or use it against you later. So it's the sad truth about having a parent that's a narcissist is that in order to live and protect ourselves and not be being actively abused all the time is you have to step back from that relationship and really be self-contained to the best of your ability and if you're a minor and you're living at home, I understand, and maybe you don't have money and that's hard, but I would say that maybe your goal should be, if you're over the age of 18, to get on your own as soon as you possibly can. And I know that that can be difficult. These are hard times, I get that. But the truth is, living, especially if the narcissist is paying for things, 
they will mm. use that to coercively control you for sure. So protect yourself, step back from the relationship. Don't reveal too much. And just accept that they're not capable of giving you maybe the, the, the proud feeling that you're looking for from a parent. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that they're not capable. Mm. Really, if they're really a diagnosable narcissist, they're really not because everything that you accomplish, they want to, they'll take credit for. And all of your mistakes are all your own. They, they won't take credit for that, but the accomplishments, they certainly will. You know? yeah. I think like letting go of that would be very um, healthy and useful because now you're not just trying to seek it. Actually, great point. It's about can you accept or can you get real with yourself about that parent's limitations so that you're not constantly in pain about what they cannot mm -hmm. give you because I guarantee you they've never given it to you. All right, thank you for that. All right, sure. well, next question. This is from Post Cult Hygie. Hygie? Mm -hmm. My friend of 38 years is now really pushing boundaries and hurting me. I need to speed up the question now. She is aware she can push me because I treasure her friendship. How do I deal with her without losing her friendship? I think you have to push back in a loving way, right? So it's like you, so she's using her boundaries to control you. Is that the, what the question Let is? Let me read that one more time. Sure. Okay, so my friend of 38 years is now really pushing boundaries and hurting me pushing boundaries and hurting me. She is aware she can push me around oh. because I treasure her friendship. How do I deal with, with her without losing her friendship? Here's the thing. I don't think your friend is pushing her boundaries. I think your friend is being manipulative from what your description is. Because if she were actually establishing boundaries with you in a healthy way, you wouldn't feel this way. Because she would be setting boundaries for herself if she is setting boundaries, quote unquote, for you, that's more manipulation. I mean, you didn't get specific, so I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but I do think that if your friend was just saying, hey, this is my boundary, I can't travel with you on this vacation because I don't have the money, that's not her doing something to you, right? That's her taking care of herself. So I think that you have to really look at what your friend is doing and get a little bit more of a backbone. You said that your love for her lets you allow her to push you around. But really think about it. Is that loving or is that just setting yourself up to be victimized and then become resentful of that friend that you value so much? And I think it's the 38 years as well. Like when you've been with somebody um, for a long time, it's harder to let go because you're like, but we've got all this history. But sometimes if you're changing, if you're evolving, if you're now starting to set boundaries and other people in your life can't respect them, it doesn't mean that just because you've been friends with them for a long time that you should still allow them to cross your own boundary. Correct. I do think sometimes we have these relationships that are more like historical handcuffs Ooh. where we don't, we feel like we don't have a choice. And I'm not saying that about what she shared because it sounds like you actually do adore this person and you love them. But I think that it's important that you assert your boundaries in a real way or have a conversation about what is happening. And could she even, I mean, they even wrote the comment like, we've been friends for 38 years. I love you. You mean so much to me. I really don't want to lose your friendship. And this is what I'm going to need for us to have a healthy friendship. Yes. Or this is what I'm experiencing mm -hmm. right now. Or this is, you did this and this is how I felt. Mm -hmm. So can you help me understand why you did that or whatever it is. But I think that the person who wrote in, who's here live, needs to figure out what need of theirs is going unmet in this friendship and then assert themselves to get it met. Mm -hmm. Love that. All right, guys, we're here. We're answering your questions live on this live YouTube. I'm so excited. This is the first time. Yeah. This is so fun. All right, next question. Okay, this is from Caitlin Caruso. How can I set boundaries as a stepmother for my stepkids and my fiance's ex-wife? So good. Ooh. Okay, this is a very common boundary conundrum and each family system is different. So the first thing to establish is with your partner. What is, what are they, what are the, the what is their um, stance on you co-parenting with them? 
right? You, you have a right to have boundaries, of course you do. But the question is like, before you even deal with the stepkids, you have to be clear with your partner. What is the expectation? Are they the only person who is disciplining the children? Are you both mm -hmm. disciplining the children? What does that look like? What Do you have a family agreement, right? I always say like, have a family meeting. You have to have rules of engagement. So we're all on the same page of like, who's got what chores and who's doing what. There has to be communication. And I find that in these family systems, a lot of times, the first thing that's missing is the effective communication. So first you wanna be in agreement with your partner. Then if, if let's just say the partner's like, yes, we're gonna be, we're gonna you know, co-parent at home together. These are the boundaries with the kids, right? You have to decide with your partner what are appropriate consequences for boundaries being broken or crossed. Whether that's um, a teenager coming in late past their curfew, what, what is going to be the consequence? Because when boundaries are violated, especially with kids, if there's no appropriate consequence ever, like if it's violated multiple times, what, what inspiration does anyone have to change if there's sort of nothing to lose, right? If they know you'll be mad, but then you'll get over and that's it. It's a little different if you say to a teenager who's just driving and now you can't use the car this weekend and then you stick to that. Like that's an appropriate consequence for coming home an hour after curfew, let's say. But again, these are things you have to establish with your partner. I think with the ex, depending on how your partner's relationship is with the ex, that will determine how you should relate to them. Mm. Because if it's a very toxic situation, you do not want to be triangulated into that situation. That has to be communication is at a minimal between your partner and their ex. That's it, right? Because a lot of times I've seen this with step parenting where the woman comes in, she's got a big heart, she wants everyone to get along, she wants to, she's trying to appease the ex, she's trying to appease her partner, she's trying to help with the, but it, what gets lost is you in all of that. Mm -hmm. So let's say the, um, the husband doesn't have a healthy relationship with the ex-wife. Is there any types of boundaries? Like, can you still intersect yourself if she's coming onto your side of the street? If she's coming to your side of the street, you have the right to draw the boundary. And I think that that also means having a family meeting, right? If she's getting, and she may not agree. The ex may not agree, right? So. I think we have to put the onus on the partner mm. to do the best they can. And listen, if the ex is toxic, then you should both keep the interaction to a minimal, to the best of your ability. Do everything by text or email, even get an intermediary if you can. Like if the, if the ex is super volatile and toxic, because had, I've had therapy clients who've been in that situation, and I'm like, you've got to keep the interaction to the bare minimal of what you have to do. Do not triangulate the children. Do not mm -hmm. talk badly ever about mm -hmm. the ex with, in front of the children. That is really damaging to kids. No, no bad mouthing. So that's also having your own communication boundary where you, may, you can say it's your partner, but you don't want the kids to feel split loyalty because it creates a really bad feeling for them. Mm -hmm. oh, God, that's so strong and what a difficult situation. So thank you for that question. That was obviously a very hard question, um, I'm sure, to write and ask. Um, but guys, we are here, YouTube Live, drop in the comments, and we can see the feed over here. Um, so thank you so, so much for just being here and interacting with us. All right. So this next question is from um, Alessa. How to set boundaries with myself and have the discipline to achieve my goals? Oh, Alessa. It's speaking my language, you're talking about internal boundaries. So your question really is, how do I strengthen my internal boundaries so that I keep my word to myself, mm -hmm. so that I follow through? So I always like to start this from doing small things, like set yourself up to succeed. So let's say you're, you're saying, I want to get in shape. I want to be in better shape. You don't decide to run an Ironman, right? We start by saying, I'm gonna walk for 10 minutes, three times a week. Do something so that you can follow through. So it's really important that we make goals that are doable, 
So a lot of times, like, that's why I don't like New Year's resolutions, because we do these massive, I'm going to change all the things. And then by February 1st, we have not changed all the things, and we feel like a loser, right? <laughs> yeah. We're like, what's wrong with me? I can't keep my word. So it's really doing small goals, because it's the day-to-day -day that is really the important step, the small steps and consistency is the queen of transformation. Mm -hmm. It's doing it consistently, even if it's Tuesdays and Thursdays or the days that you're gonna walk for 15 minutes. If you do that for a month, you will feel great mm -hmm. about yourself. And I think that we have to look at what is the secondary gain for not following through? Because a lot of times it's deeper than we think. Like we just like to make ourselves feel bad and be like, oh, I just don't have discipline. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. I had a client who wanted to date and she wanted to lose weight. And she was like, I'm not gonna date until I lose 10 pounds. I didn't think she needed to lose any weight, but there was something, she couldn't lose the 10 pounds. Couldn't do it, tried everything. And I was like, hmm, something else is going on. So I said to her, hey, what is the secondary gain? Which the questions you ask are, what do I get to not face, not feel, not experience, by staying stuck here, by not losing the weight. And she immediately said, I get to not be vulnerable and date. Ooh. So a lot of times when we're not following through, there's really something a little bit deeper happening It's protecting us from feeling too vulnerable or feeling too exposed or we're afraid to fail. There's a lot of things. So if you find yourself repeatedly sort of falling down on yourself, Ask yourself those three questions. What do I get to not face, not feel, not experience by not changing, by staying here? And I feel like once we reveal the secondary gain, it's so much easier to make the changes because we could be compassionate. Mm -hmm. So with my client, we were able now to talk about what the actual problem was, which was her fear of dating. She's like, maybe I don't know how to do this. Maybe I'm just bad at relationships. We talked about all of that which was the actual problem. It wasn't about calories in, calories out. Mm -hmm. She knows how to lose 10 pounds. It was her fear of being vulnerable that stopped her from following through. Mm. God, I love that. And then to add to the habits thing of, for me, it was very helpful to write down um, what I was looking to do and then what's getting in my way and then eliminating that obstacle. So for instance, if it's losing weight, well, I really have the propensity to go for chocolate at midnight. Don't have chocolate in the house, right? Like don't beat yourself up, but just know right now I'm not strong enough to stay disciplined in this area. So if I don't feel strong enough yet, how can I um, eliminate the obstacles that maybe I face? Or I don't have time. Okay, put it in your calendar, set an alarm, like I'm very forgetful. So I've got literally like 15 alarms every single day because I don't like being late and I don't want to miss meetings and so okay well I know this about myself I don't beat myself up about my like that I'm like this I just come up with strategies in order to make sure that I don't um, self-sabotage yes and what's so great about that is that you're looking at looking I'd love looking at it like that like what is the obstacle like literally what gets in the way and you would be shocked at how much of the time the actual answer just pops into your mm -hmm. mind and you're like oh so now this is the thing that I can change yeah, and then that. that one little bit of credibility where you're like, oh my God, I didn't eat chocolate at midnight tonight. You know, and then it starts to build that self-esteem yes. that then makes you feel better about yourself, which then ends up giving you the confidence to then do the thing that you really want to do. Exactly. Yeah. Love it. Love it. All right, next question. Okay, this is from Brenna Franklin. How do I set boundaries with a step-parent who doesn't like me without walking away from my real parent? First of all, I'm sorry that you're having that experience because a step parent who doesn't like you and you're the kid, that's about them, not you, because there's nothing unlikable about you. So you're really saying, how can I be the grown up in a situation where the other person is supposed to be the grown up? So my feeling is don't have high expectations for them. Draw your boundaries. Don't make yourself emotionally um, vulnerable to someone if they've already proven to you that they're untrustworthy, or you can be really bold and have a conversation. If, if we're not talking about an abusive situation, right? Because you may think they don't like you. Maybe they do. May, maybe something is going on for you. So, I mean, th these are choices that you have to make. So my first answer was going on that it's a fact that they don't like you, and that would then be on them and not you. 
But I want you to consider, and I don't know because you haven't given me more information, right? Consider that maybe you are feeling that way and maybe it's not accurate. And maybe you could have a conversation with them, right? Mm -hmm. As long as there's not abuse and they're not abusive. And if, let's say it's not abuse and you just disagree or you don't get along with them, um, I think so. I have a stepmom. I actually love her and I get along very well with her. But I would think of like treating them as separate people. Like you can have a relationship with one parent and maybe distance yourself from your step parent. Yep. You have every right to do that, right? It, they don't have to be a package deal because you are blood related to your bio parent and they chose this other person. And I really feel like it's on the adult other person to try to get along with you, to put in an effort. Right? Yeah. Well, actually, then going back to a question that we answered earlier, maybe that step parent has massive insecurity, doesn't know how to interact with their stepchild. And so maybe they've also got confusion. I need to set boundaries. I'm not sure what to do. And so if you can come together and hopefully have an open communication, maybe then you can get on the same page because it's probably not easy for either side. Right. But it really is required of the step parent to really be the grown up. Like it's, it's always required for the grown ups to be the grown-ups. But what if Brenna's a uh, grown-up as well? Like, what if this person is 30, 40 years old? Then I'd definitely have a conversation. Right. <laughs> if, if you're really grown-up and it's been years and years. But again, by this point, though, if they've been your step-parent for decades, probably space is the way to go. Nurture the relationship with the parent that you love and sort of tolerate the, the other person, right? We want to be respectful enough so that you can still have a relationship with the other parent. Um, but it's just sad because there's really enough love to go around. My feeling is there doesn't have, not have to be, there's not a lack of love in the world, right? You can, you can love your step parent, you can love your bio parent and they can love you and love bio kids. Like that's one attitude. And I know not everyone has that attitude, but I feel like it's really possible. Mm. Guys, if you're liking this, I'm, I'm having so much fun here. If you guys are liking this YouTube live, drop in the comments. Like, I want to hear from you guys. We'll, after this live, we'll go back and I'll read all the comments. So let us know what you like. If you want us to do this again, um, what is enticing? What's, you know, interesting that you're actually watching us live? Um, and then like this video. So that would be great. And if you're not subscribed, which hopefully you are, <laughs> but if you're not subscribed, obviously make sure that you subscribe. Okay, next question. All right, this is from Esther Park. How do I know if I'm being gaslit and what are the signs? What a good question. Signs, well, you not trusting your own reality. How often does someone in your life, you could be gaslit by a parent, a sibling, a partner, right? So let's just say it's a partner. How often is the other person saying, what are you talking about? That didn't happen. I never said that, right? How often are you um, questioning your own interpretation of reality? Um, so what does gaslighting actually look like? What is it? It's when someone is being dishonest with you. It's when someone is trying to make you question your reality so that they will have more control over you. Because the more confused you are, the more, um, you're not trusting your gut instinct anymore because of, I mean, this is psychological abuse. I mean, that is what gaslighting is for sure. But it can come in all types of ways. It can come with them saying that someone else, like if they're trying to manipulate you, they're like, I wasn't gonna say anything to you. But Betty also thinks that what you're doing lately is crazy, right? Using words like, why are you acting crazy? Like, that's crazy. Are you crazy? Like, that, those things. And then there's other things that I, I actually had a client whose partner, they were going to get divorced, and the partner was really gaslighting her in a way that I was like, this should be a movie. It was so scary. But they would do things like hide her car keys. Even though she always put them in the same place, they would put them somewhere, and then she would find them and be like, what are they doing here? And they're like, I don't know. You, you, I, I'm really worried. You're, you're losing it. I'm worried oh, about you. Like that was an actual thing that happened. Lie, and lying, bold-faced lying about what they did or didn't say. So that you're, they're like, I never said that. I said we could talk about it. I didn't say I would do You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like making these small changes to what the conversation was where you're like, did I get it wrong? Maybe I did. I don't know. 
that's what starts happening. Ooh, yeah, I think the word gaslighting initially came from like back in the 1800s or whatever, where a guy would um, like dim the gaslight ever so slightly, like each day or you know every couple of hours. And the wife's like, "Is it getting dark in here?" It's like, "What are you talking about? You're going yes. crazy." It was actually a movie. Oh, and it was made in remakes. It was one that was made oh. like in the 40s, and then it was remade. I think of the 60s, and that was exactly right. He was trying to drive her mad with being like, "It's not dark in here. What's wrong with you?" Yeah, God. Guys, guys, I can't believe we've already been going for 30 minutes. This is insane. Thank you so, so much for asking your questions, for joining us here. This community means the world to me. The reason why I show up every day and do what I do is to honestly help other women uh, and other people just um, in all areas. I, when I think about what's the thing that I needed when I was younger and this is it having amazing women like Terry on this show to be able to come and help and just give such tremendous advice. So please, please do drop in the comments what are the things that you really love that you heard from Terry today. And then also, don't forget, Terry's got a workbook out, so go check it out. If you haven't already read her book, you definitely got to read her book. I talk about her, your book everywhere, by the way. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, she's now got a workbook out, so go check this out. And guys, thank you so much. Again, let me know if you want to see more of these because this hopefully is just the beginning. I definitely plan Plan. If you guys um, are really like it, it does bring value. I definitely plan to bring on more people um, that can give you, uh, you guys advice in real time. So if you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Billu. And guys, honestly, if you're not subscribed, subscribe to this channel and then just share this video with a friend or share, share Women of Impact with a friend in order to create global impact. We've got to do it together, my homie. So please do share this with your mates. And until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace. Thank you for joining, Terry. Hey, it was we so did good. it. We did it. Ooh.